capital of the Transkei, members of the first Bantu government elected under South Africa's policy of separate development vote for their first chief minister. The election of Mr. Kaiser Matansima, a practicing lawyer and language expert... Is... The new South Africa, which is being constructed by the measures announced today, holds within it great promise for the building up of friendship and cooperation between the races. It furthermore guarantees to each the retention of his own identity. All the nations of the world should give South Africa a fair chance to establish and develop its own commonwealth of nations. My decision is for the future. And therefore, even if in these present matters we were to find greater trouble, not less, developing, then in general principle that could not deprive me of the right of doing what we think is right, provided we are sure that we are providing justice to all, to whites and to blacks, and that we are creating permanent solutions for whites and for blacks. I always choose for final solutions, for final solutions, for final solutions, final solutions, final solutions, the Nationalist Party government, the Nationalist Party government had reached what it called, it regarded the final solution of the native problem in South Africa. And they were going to carry out policies to that effect. In the Zeyrast area of the Transvaal, another step was taken towards giving Africans a share in their own government. Representatives of six tribes met Mr. De Vet Mel of the South African government to receive from him the symbols of their new authority. An African interpreted his speech into tribal language. Each of the six chiefs received a briefcase containing the documents of his appointment. The six tribes will amalgamate to administer an area of more than 800 square miles. The chairman of the authority will be Chief Lucas, whose father was the paramount chief before his death. He is well liked and is certain to be respected by his people. Those who don't yet understand democracy at least know that Chief Lucas will rule justly. In his own village... The whole policy of apartheid was insulting. All intelligent people realize it is something which had no room whatsoever. Uh, it's, it was not a question of militant and, 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 uh, and moderates, but intelligent people generally rejected the ideology of apartheid. The African National Congress and its allies had spelled out their own vision for South Africa at the 1955 Congress of the People. The Freedom Charter called for a united, democratic and non-racial South Africa. The adoption of the Charter, however, highlighted the long-standing tensions between the main body of the ANC and the small but vocular Africanist faction led by Robert Sobukwe and Patrick Lebalo. They launched a campaign against the uh, Congress of the People. And then when the Charter was adopted, when the Freedom Charter was adopted, they then attacked it as a complete and total departure from the program of action of 1949. The program of action of 1949 had said that the struggle was inspired by the ideas of African nationalism. Whereas the Freedom Charter began with the sentence, 
South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white. And these chefs said, now there is a betrayal. The country doesn't belong to the uh, blacks and the whites, it belongs to the blacks only. And another important section which um, they were um, concerned about was that uh, the land will be uh, given to those who work it. Uh, this, therefore, meant that uh, to them was used at least as an excuse to say that you want the land to be remain to the, um, the Boers. That is how they put it. Everything was done to stem the tide of a breakaway, to try to convince them. But by 1958, especially after they failed at the 1957 National Conference in Orlando East to take over power, from the leadership that was in the treason trial. I don't think anyone who was analyzing the situation regretted the fact that they broke away. Moving into the 60s, both the ANC and the newly formed PAC singled out the hated influx and pass control laws as a focus of continuing mass resistance campaign. Those who lived uh, during the days of, uh, during those days, would not like to go through it again, because it was a terrible period in the history of our country. when. Uh, you must leave home in the morning, forget your, your pass book, and then you jump off the bus in town going to work, and then somebody comes and uh, asks for a pass. If you don't have it, then uh, you go to prison. Uh, the African National Congress was now mobilizing the people to ban the passes on the 31st of March. 1960, 1960. Of course, the Pan-Africans jumped the, the what do you call it, before that. The PAC had not been preparing for this. But they knew that uh, this was a very popular issue. And therefore, they decided to, to hijack the idea, announce on the 18th of March, that they were launching on the 21st. The massacre at Sharpville evoked worldwide protest and criticism against the South African government and its race policy. Internally, the shootings precipitated mass demonstrations across the country, particularly Cape Town and the adjoining township of Langa, where the police shooting of more protesters resulted in three weeks of intense conflict and rioting. Sharpville happened, Langa happened, but the ANC immediately responded by calling for a national day of protest and mourning. Sharpville happened on Monday the 21st. The ANC called for the national day of mourning uh, and protest for the 28th, Monday the 28th. Uh, the response was very promising. Uh, 
widespread. And then, of course, there was the uh, burning of the passes by Chief Latuli and ANC leaders. That started spreading. Our passes. We, 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 we didn't even bother to say that the, so many people were killed in Shambi. We continued with our, our past campaign. Chief Lituli in Holland, in Orlando, there, uh, burned his passes together with Sisulu and Mandela. We also burned our passes. The political turmoil engulfing the country caused widespread panic within the white community. Shares on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange plummeted dramatically. On March the 30th, the government proclaimed a state of emergency and over 2,000 people were detained. On April the 8th, both the ANC and the PAC were declared illegal. The banning of the ANC led immediately to the decision that uh, we do not uh, dissolve, we don't uh, accept the ban. We then went underground and machinery was set up throughout the country to carry on the struggle on the ground. So that it changed the character and it uh, required a new approach and a new thinking. Uh, we were in the prison trial and we realized that um, the position had changed. We, we just had to do something different. While brutally attempting to break the back of African resistance in the urban centers, the nationalist government was having to contend with spontaneous outbreaks of rural resistance against the policies of Grand Apartheid. In places like Zirast, Sekukuniland, and Pondoland in the Transkai, the peasantry rose up in revolt. <laughs> In the Transkai, the nationalist government granted more powers through the traditional authority, the Bunga, in terms of the Bandu Authorities Act. This made chiefs and headmen de facto agents of the government having to enforce highly unpopular measures. He was again pointing out that when Bandustan comes, cattle will be reduced, sheep, whatever, and land is going to be cut 50 by 50. Or somebody wants a site is going to pay all those things from 1957 pondos didn't like it people started uh, by holding meetings on the hills and the, there was one uh, place uh, Jovo hill used to meet there uh, but uh, they had smaller places i mean of meeting at their local places and um, the chiefs started uh, going out now to tell the government that there's going to be a meeting at a certain place. And before the people met, the police were already there. And now people started targeting the chiefs. They started to burn the houses, burning the councillors, because now we didn't know who elected those councillors. They were not elected by the people. The government here in Bizana, he was used to send Saracen, heavy weapons, shooting people at night, killing people at night. We had nothing. We had only sticks. Even the ANC had to send dog garbage. 
and Tom Gobi to come and assess the situation. Why the Pondos now are, pre are preparing to fight? When I was talking to them, I could see a revolutionary set within those people. They were real eager. I'm sure they were, they were far ahead of the leadership, in fact, of the ANC. The revolt in Pondoland lasted over 10 months and hundreds of people lost their lives. In one incident at Musa Hill, 11 Pondos were killed by army gunfire and many more injured. The Pondos themselves employed guerrilla-style strategies to launch counter-attacks. A number of Pondo leaders were convicted in South African courts and subsequently executed. After 11 months, the revolt was suppressed by the government. The government brought in troops, and um, these troops started arresting every male, every adult male. And uh, after interrogation was released, and the following day, they would um, harness another area and arrest all the adult male, and uh, so that is how it went, and uh, that is how the rebellion was crushed. All the leaders, they were banished, some in Kimberley, myself and Toples Changela in French Day, and the rest was deported to these nearest areas. Pizana people had to take to Flagstaff, Flagstaff all over right up to Tolo, whatever in Transkai. Our people were then there without food. In further pursuance of the apartheid dream, Prime Minister Ferragut moved South Africa, still a part of the British Commonwealth, towards the formation of a republic. A whites-only referendum on the issue was conducted in June 1960. The time is more than right for launching the republic. In view of what is happening elsewhere in Africa, it has become increasingly clear that we need that unity which alone will give the strength which is indispensable. I wish to make an earnest appeal to South Africa. Let us transcend all pettiness and selfishness. The danger is moving southwards, and communism, which is seeking to extend its grip on the world, compel us to grasp one another's hands. I appeal to the English South Africa. You could do wonders for good relations by helping the Afrikaner to achieve his greatest ideal of a republic. This is our country, our government, our defense group, our commercial and industrial life, our mind, our agriculture, everything is ours together. We immediately looked at this as a challenge. Here must come a parting of ways. We're now uh, thinking directly of a new outlook in South Africa. No white-only referendum must take place. This is how we looked at it. But externally, we already had uh, Oliver Tambo and Dadu and others were operating outside the country. And uh, they managed to get the Commonwealth uh, Conference uh, in 1960 to um, uh, oppose the policies of apartheid and to say that those policies were incompatible with uh, membership of the Commonwealth. Uh, 
And South Africa didn't wait to be expelled. They, they withdrew from the Commonwealth themselves and announced that they would become a republic outside the uh, Commonwealth. Despite the banning of the ANC, over 1,400 delegates met in March 61 for an All in Africa conference in Peter Maritzburg to discuss strategies and responses to the intended formation of the White Republic. We didn't know what was going to happen except that we are coming to that All in conference. Mandela had been underground for many years, I think 10 years, I don't know. Um, so nobody ever thought he was going to appear. But uh, soon after the opening of the conference, Mandela appeared from behind the hall and uh, to a standing ovation. And uh, hey, it was a real hero's welcome because nobody expected him. He changed the mood of the conference uh, to a very high degree. I was uh, burned and my burn expired shortly a few days before that. So I was able to attend the conference because the government was not aware of the, expi uh, the, expiry, the expiration of, uh, of my ban. And uh, that was uh, a very important conference because um, we asked the government to call a national convention to draw up a new constitution for the country. We then said that if the government failed to call that convention, we would uh, embark on a three-day strike and, uh, and uh, apply uh, the policy of non-cooperation with the government. And that's important. That part of that resolution, the ANC will embark on non-cooperation. Now, it didn't define what the nature of non-cooperation was. But I suppose the government thought, ah, they are just talking. Nothing would happen. And of course, that was also another watershed. There was still one to come, and that was the 1961 strike against the Republican Constitution, which was led by Mandela. But by that time, a lot of people were asking questions regarding the uh, strategies that had been uh, um, carried on before. The response of the state was brutal. Uh, for the first time, we saw massive police and army in the townships, forcing people to go to work. But in spite of that treatment meted out to our people by the state, uh, our militants did, still stayed at home and didn't go to work. The strike was highly successful. Are you planning any more campaigns of non-cooperation? Yes. The Peter Marisbeck resolution makes provision for campaign of non-cooperation with the government, and we are presently studying plans to implement uh, this aspect of the resolution. Now, if Dr. Vervoort's government doesn't give you the kind of concessions that you want sometime soon, is there any likelihood of violence? There are many people who feel that uh, the reaction of the government to our stay at home, ordering a general mobilization, arming the white community, arresting 10,000 of Africans, the show of force throughout the country. Notwithstanding our clear declaration that this campaign is being run on peaceful and non-violent lines, close the chapter as far as our methods of political struggle are concerned. 
31 mei 1961. En van vroeg dag af het hulle gekom, kinders, middeljariges en ouders van daar, om hulde te brengen aan de eerste staatspresident van de Republiek van Zuid-Afrika, wat onder geleide van een Reuterwag op pad was naar die Bosmanstraatse kerk, waar die inhuldigingsplechtigheid zo plaatsvindt. So Mandela is saying to us that, look, our own, own ANC membership, you know, trusted members of the ANC in various parts of the country, were being demoralized, as it, as it were, by this continued insistence on non-violence at all costs, uh, when in fact there was brutality coming from the state. Chief Lutuli then demanded that Mandela must come to him and explain what he meant by this. Mandela did that. And this resulted in a, a large meeting of uh, delegates coming from throughout the regions of the ANC. At this meeting, there was a lot of disagreement. The older leadership led by Chief Lutuli and others felt that this would be an entirely wrong uh, decision. And uh, people like uh, Mandela and Sisulu were pressing for a new approach to the struggle. And it ended up with what I think was an untidy uh, decision. The decision was that the ANC itself, as an organization, would not participate in forming an armed wing. The ANC and other sections of the Congress Alliance would continue with the policy of uh, non-violence and peaceful struggle. But that, uh, because of the situation prevailing at the time, I was free to form this organization and to liaise with any other organiz underground organization whose objective was identical with ours. Well, initially, really, um, one could describe the decision as a decision to create uh, groups that would engage in armed propaganda. There was no uh, illusion created that we could, through acts of sabotage, succeed in overthrowing the state. But uh, we regarded it at that very early stage as a catalyst uh, for uh, insp uh, inspiring people. And um, perhaps uh, knocking some sense into the other side. When the ANC announced that it was, it, it, it was going underground and when the AN, or MK was formed, then you could see that people were happy now, that we are going to fight. Quite long ago, my forebearers extended a hand of friendship to people of Europe when they came to that continent. What has happened to the extension of that hand, only history can, can say. To be frank, we are not really uh, so. The, 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 the raw, if you use the language, the, but we, we put them into action. Misery will ignite the manner. But in order to hasten the process, you must add something else, and that is magnesium. 
Occasionally we managed to steal some TNT from the mines. But by and large, everything we did at that point in time was our own manufacture in, in our houses and our flats and our garages. I worked for the municipal laboratories. It was very good for me. There was everything, there's sulfuric acid. And uh, I would take these things and uh, take them and go and make bombs, you know, napal bombs, Molotov cocktails. But it became pretty obvious soon thereafter from the response of the other side that we weren't going to get any positive response. And therefore, more discussions took place. And it just felt obviously we're not going to get anywhere in the long run uh, without uh, raising the armed part of the struggle to a different level and without investing in, in a future escalation because it became pretty clear that that is what we would eventually have to do. So we began uh, then to recruit people to uh, send them outside for the purpose of becoming skilled in the art of basically guerrilla warfare. So already the seeds of future guerrilla warfare were planted. Mandela himself slipped out of the country in January 62, attending a Pan-African Freedom Conference and making arrangements for the training of MK recruits abroad. There was a tremendous manhunt for him throughout the country. I mean, I personally was stopped on several occasions, not because they knew me, uh, or not because they knew my car, but because all over the country there were roadblocks. Uh, and on several occasions, including on one occasion in Swaziranika, uh, where they stopped me, uh, searched the car and said on Sukhdi Kafir Mandela. I returned uh, uh, in July and uh, then I went to Durban to go and report to Lutuli. There was a bit of opposition uh, from uh, some members of the national executive because it was regarded as being highly risky that I should undertake this trip but uh, the executive felt that it was proper that I should go and give a report to Lutuli. And I was arrested on the 5th of August as I was coming back. Mandela, 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 I felt, firstly, that a conviction was inevitable. I conducted my own trial, and uh, uh, my perception of the trial was that uh, we should turn the tables against the enemy. Mandela refused to recognize the authority of the court stating that as a black man in South Africa, there was no possibility of justice coming from a white man's court. He was sentenced to five years imprisonment for inciting workers to strike and leaving the country illegally. Despite outrage and major protests, the government introduced draconian legislation in the form of the Sabotage Act and subsequent provision for 90-day detention without trial in an attempt to destroy the liberation movement's underground network. At first, you know, we'd get arrested and uh, the lawyers would come and take us out, you see. But when they introduced all these things, like for instance, uh, the Sabotage Act and so on, I don't think we were prepared for that because many of our comrades became easy victims. And uh, these uh, 90 days also caused uh, a great deal of hard work on us. Comrades were not prepared for that. I mean, you are all by yourself, no visitors. Uh, you are just kept there. There's no lawyer who's going to come and say, no, uh, you must uh, be given bail and so on, you see. It did uh, have a blow on us. 
By mid-1963, over 125 people have been convicted under the Sabotage Act and began serving long-term prison sentences on Robben Island. The security net was now closing in on Mkonto's National High Command, who had been meeting regularly at the Communist Party's underground headquarters in Rivonia. I should say that it was a very difficult situation. I had not yet got to the headquarters of the ANC, which was the plan. We had to go, to, we had succeeded to get to the headquarters of the, uh, of the MK in Travelin. The Communist Party was planning um, to abandon uh, temporarily the use of the uh, Vonia. I and others appealed that uh, allow the uh, particular meeting to take place because it was essential to sift out a number of things. It would have to be the last day. Well, indeed, it was the last day in a different way. We saw coming into the yard, you know, of um, a laundry van. And we thought that it was just coming for laundry. To our surprise, it was the security patch. And it's quite clear that they had the entire, you know, uh, set up in the, in, in the farm, you know, in their minds, where they advanced to where we were sitting. I jumped out, Govan and Kathy, through the window, but they were already there. And um, indicated that uh, you, one move, we shoot. And when we were caught, remember, Foster had passed legislation to say, for sabotage activities, you hang. And so, when we were caught, we expected we might be hanged. Well, we would have been hanged in the course of carrying out our own decisions. So what? Mandela was charged, together with those captured at Rivonia, becoming accused number one in the trial which included Sisulu, Mbeki, Goldberg, Katrada, Mshaba, Mutswaledi, and Mlangi. The charge was one of high treason. Our approach was one of defiance. Our plea reflected that mood. Because uh, we said, of course in different words, it is the government uh, that is a criminal and that should be standing in the dock to face a trial. We are not guilty. That was our approach. I have fought against white domination and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the idea of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve. But if need be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. by no means convinced that the matters of the accused were as altruistic as they wished the court to believe. People who organize a revolution usually plan to take over the government and personal ambition cannot be excluded as a motive. The crime of which the accused have been convicted, that is the main crime, the crime of conspiracy, is in essence one of high treason. Bearing this in mind and giving the matter very serious consideration, I have decided not to impose the supreme penalty, which in a case like this would usually be the proper penalty for the crime. But consistent with my duty, that is the only leniency which I can show. The sentence in the case of all the accused will be one of life imprisonment. already 
they told us that we'll be seeing our visitors the next day and the lawyers and so forth. But that very night, they came at about uh, 12 or 1 o'clock and suddenly put on the lights and they said, get ready. And then they chained us, handcuffed us and the leg irons. I was chained to Mbeki, I remember. And uh, under very, very strong security, the army, the police and the prison, we were driven to a military airport, put on the plane and and taken to Robben Island. The crime of the men of Rivonia. Was to organize farmer and miner. Well, I must say for me, the person, I was already relieved. And um, I was out of Pretoria with all its uh, frustrating uh, appearance and shouting and all that. I was feeling that I am here in a new situation and I was now determined, no matter how long. And I, I was free mentally as from that moment. Freedom and justice as we have been shown uh, to Robin Island, the investigating officer said uh, to one of us, Ah, don't worry about uh, this sentence. I can assure you, you won't finish five years in prison. You will come out as heroes uh, with uh, uh, women, you know, running around uh, you. you and uh, everybody wanting your friendship. Um, but uh, we stayed there for 27 years. And uh, when we came out, uh, the women didn't run around us. Uh, they s remained aloof. So that was an exaggeration. But uh, we believed very strongly that uh, we would not die in jail. We would return. Now, externally, the effect of it was, uh, was really devastating. Uh, Tambo was then still in London, but it became clear that there was no headquarters in the country, therefore a headquarters would have to be established. So he moved from London and went to uh, Tanzania. And uh, he then started setting up a, a headquarters then. And it then meant also that the external mission had to assume leadership of the ANC. It was no longer just an external mission. And uh, the, those, those leaders were placed in a very difficult and impossible situation of uh, working out a strategy thousands of kilometers from South Africa, away from the, 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 the mass base of the people inside the country. And uh, it was a real problem. Meanwhile, those comrades had been sent for training. They finished their training, ready to go back into the country. But there, were, there, were, but there was no reception for those comrades. In addition, in our own situation, we faced uh, probably a, a problem that has not been faced by other liberation movements. There was no real base for the struggle in South Africa to speak of. South Africa was uh, surrounded by countries which were under colonial domination. Under intense pressure from the cadres within the camps, a decision was made to undertake a joint military campaign with the Zimbabwean liberation movement, ZAPU. Two major guerrilla incursions into Rhodesia would be launched, known as the Wanki and the Sapulilo campaign. Just prior to the launch of the campaign, Chief Lutuli, who was serving a long-term banishment order in Natal, died. 
In his honor, Oliver Tambo declared the first detachment to cross the Zambezi, the Lituli Detachment. <laughs> For most of us, this was uh, the realization of our dreams as uh, young combatants. We had been given very, very, you know, thorough training in the Soviet Union, and we had undergone a lot of physical and military preparations in Zambia because we established a special camp in Zambia to to prepare ourselves both physically, mentally, and militarily. We had exercises day and night. We embarked on long marches. So we were, we had prepared thoroughly for this day. We feel we are superior. Even now, I, 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 I think uh, 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 we are well trained. We are well trained. Because if we did not fight back as we did, we should have been wiped off. South African troops were deployed to help the Rhodesian forces. A number of MK cadres were killed in action. Others were captured and sentenced to life imprisonment in Rhodesia. The decision to make a strategic retreat into Botswana unexpectedly resulted in the sentencing of many of the cadres to long-term prison sentences in that country. After the Wenki campaign and even more uh, after the Sipolilo campaign, where a lot of our people were killed, I mean, they, they, they walked into an ambush uh, where Patrick Mulawa and others were killed. After this, especially when Chris Hani returned from prison in uh, Botswana, uh, there was a lot of restlessness in, uh, among the uh, cadres of the ANC. In the first place, the leadership itself or many of them were seen to be to have settled in these areas we were living in houses in uh, lilande township in zambia or in uh, uh, morogoro some people had their wives with them meantime the cadres were you know in camps Dovu camp Kongwa camp with no apparent strategy in the minds of the leadership as to how this situation was going to be resolved or getting people home to go and fight. And Chris Hani uh, organized a group and they presented a uh, petition. It was an extremely critical uh, petition, almost a rebellion. Yes, I had a lot of dissatisfaction. I was a, a militant and angry young man. I wanted to go back and fight after resting, after resting for a few months. I found our movement totally unprepared for the continuation of the armed struggle in South Africa. That was my reading of the situation. Of course, there were reasons that they were put forward. I found a lot of preoccupation with solidarity work, with international work. And I found a lot of uh, demoralization amongst uh, our chaps who were in camps in, in, in Zambia. And I began to agitate for the resumption of the armed struggle, for seriousness on the part of the leadership. I'm using the word seriousness because in my own view, and this was a subjective point of view, that they were not serious. A lot of the criticisms were valid. And therefore, it was decided to call a conference representative of everybody externally uh, at Morogoro. 
it was certainly a turning point for our struggle for the ANC and the Allies because it began to address the whole question of a revolutionary strategy to pursue our struggle inside the country. It established uh, an organ of uh, the revolutionary struggle, the Revolutionary Council, with full-time officials whose main objective was to build the underground inside the country, uh, to send comrades inside the country and to prepare conditions for military training within South Africa. It identified the need to build a mass movement in addition to the underground. And uh, the, it, it began now for, for the first time to, to address the question of roots. And uh, for me, therefore, the Morogoro Conference was, uh, I won't call it a vindication, but an understanding of some of the points probably put down crudely by youngsters. But it addressed, you see, I would say 80% of uh, uh, the, 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 the issues we raised uh, in our memorandum. It balanced international work with the need to build uh, strong organs of the movement inside the country. While the Morogoro Conference set the ANC on a new phase of revolutionary struggle, the task of rebuilding organization inside the country would be a long and arduous one. For the majority of whites, enjoying the yields of an economic boom, it seemed as if the threat of black resistance to apartheid had been firmly crushed. What do you, what do you think? Will it take a hundred years for them to become civilized? Well, I should say, I should say much, much more than that, Chairman.